start broadcast. Hi everyone, good afternoon and thank you all for joining. My name is Kelsey Judd and I am the Operations Manager for Biosafety and Biosecurity Programs with Merrick. This is the first of Merrick's Biosafety and Biosecurity webinar series in 2019 um, and today's topic is Life Sciences Facility Operational Planning. It will be presented by Dr. Ryan Burnett, Steve Lewis, and Andrew Aldrian. But before I introduce our presenters, I'd like to share a few details about the mechanics of the webinar. So today, all participants are muted. If you do have a question, please find the question box on your GoToWebinar control panel and type your question. There will be opportunities throughout the webinar to address these questions. However, if time runs short, any of the unanswered questions will be responded to in writing and provided to the attendee list as soon as possible. A link to today's recording will also be posted on the Merrick website. Instructions for accessing this will be provided to all participants by email shortly afterwards. As an interactive webinar, today's session will feature polls and discussion questions that you all will have the opportunity to respond to. When a poll comes up during the webinar, we'll direct your attention to the question, and you can respond by clicking from the multiple choice answers. Your answers will be anonymous, and tallied responses will be shared for all attendees to see. As a test, we're going to go ahead and try a quick, simple one. So hopefully you can all see the screen. The test poll says, are you enjoying the weather in your area today? We went ahead and opened the poll. And we'll give you a few seconds to answer. Okay, we're going to go ahead and close the poll. It looks like most of you have answered. And you should be able to see the tallied result. For any discussion questions we have that you may, that may come up during the presentation, feel free to answer your responses and thoughts in the text box for questions and we'll use those responses to lead the rest of the discussion. If you have any questions or technical difficulties during the presentation, please use the questions feature in your GoToWebinar control panel and we'll try to answer those as they come up. So now I'd like to introduce today's presenters and the content creators for the webinar. First up, we have Dr. Ryan Burnett. Ryan is the Director of Biosafety and Biosecurity Programs at Merrick in the Life Sciences Business Unit. He's consulted on bio-risk management programs and biocontainment laboratories at academic, government, and industrial clients in the U.S. and over 30 countries. He's currently the program manager supporting the multifaceted operational planning of the National Bio and Agro-Defense Facility as a contractor to the U.S. Department of Homeland Security and Department of Agriculture. Next up, we have Dr. Lauren Richardson. Dr. Richardson has a background in veterinary medicine and public health with experience in large and small animal clinical medicine, food safety and defense, and infectious disease. Last year, Dr. Richardson joined Merrick and Company's Life Sciences Unit as the Associate Director of Biosafety and Biosecurity Programs. Before joining Merrick, she provided technical subject matter expertise and project management for international projects focused on food safety, laboratory, and health systems capacity, capacity building. Prior to this work, she worked in equine and mixed large animal private practice in Virginia, North Carolina. Dr. Richardson also serves as a veterinarian in the U.S. Army Reserve. She holds a Doctor of Veterinary Medicine from the Virginia, Maryland Regional College of Veterinary Medicine and a Bachelor of Science in Biology from the University of Virginia. Next, we have Steve Lewis who is a biosecurity and project management professional with more than eight years of experience leading teams in federal, life science, and startup environments. He currently leads the information technology and biologics development operational planning efforts for the forthcoming National Bio and Agro-Defense Facility, the first large animal BSL-4 ag facility in the United States. Steve has worked in BSL-2, BSL-3 ag, and BSL-4 ag laboratories and has CGMP training and clean facility experience. 
He is a certified Scrum Master and is highly experienced in biosecurity, project management, IT, cybersecurity, bioprocessing, and scale-up technologies, biosafety, design, product development, and machine learning. Finally, for today, we've got Andrew Aldrian, who's an experienced and certified project management professional and logistics specialist with nearly eight years of experience serving clients within the U.S. Department of Defense and U.S. Department of Homeland Security in the areas of project and program management, government acquisition, contract management, shipping, logistics, supply chain management, and U.S. export compliance. He currently serves as a project manager within American Companies Life Sciences Business Unit Biosafety and Biosecurity Program. And with that, I will turn it over to Ryan to begin today's webinar. All right, thank you everybody for taking the time to join us. Um, <clears throat> we hope today's webinar is going to be useful, informative, uh, and timely. We want to be respectful of your time for joining this as well. So the agenda for today is we're going to take an overview of what operational planning is. It sounds like something we should all know what it is, but perhaps we don't, or perhaps we could learn some more. We're going to take that into sort of a, a process or stepwise uh, um, approach, look at operational models as a framework for success. Uh, Andrew is going to cover for us a lot of the project management approaches and tools that uh, are, so are sort of a, a variation on a theme. Uh, none of the project management tools are necessarily new, but the way that we use them in operational planning efforts uh, is pretty novel. Steve is going to take us through some of the IT challenges, but also the opportunities uh, that present themselves when we're going through operational planning. We're going to talk a little bit about the transition management. Uh, we're going to we're going to take a few different perspectives, and you know, on are these new facilities? Are we transitioning into a different building? Uh, uh, are we phasing out all of the different scenarios that we might be needing to do some good transition planning? And then finally, you know, a little bit about execution, establishing laboratory operations. So first of all, just briefly, a little bit about Merrick, who we are and what we do. Uh, we're about a 600 plus uh, person consulting engineering firm. Uh, markets that we serve primarily in energy, national security, life sciences and infrastructure. Uh, we are pushing 65 years old at this point, which is kind of hard to believe. And we've got offices, uh, about 20 locations, mainly in the U.S., but also in Canada, Mexico, and the U.K. So I talked a little bit about the markets, or at least mentioned them. You can see here some of the submarkets that we dabble in, in terms of energy, oil and gas, industrial biotech, power, uh, national security, uh, very large market, of course, DOD, nuclear, uh, NASA, aerospace. Life sciences, which is where we hail from today. Uh, we do a lot of work with the federal government. Of course, we do an awful lot of academic and uh, industrial private. Uh, and of course, biosafety and biosecurity. Those of you that have sort of followed us over the past several years know that that's a developing area for, for Merrick. And of course, infrastructure may not sound as sexy to talk about water and transportation land development. Um, I encourage you to visit the website. We have some pretty interesting things going on. We have an updated map about where Merrick has spread its wings. So if you've wondered, you know, in addition to the 20 office locations, where have we worked? Uh, you can see that other than the gray countries, uh, we've, we've had boots on the ground and, and projects in a, a large part of the world. We've been very fortunate to work with a lot of really good people and clients uh, around the globe on a variety of efforts. I like this slide because I feel like sometimes we focus on the what companies do as opposed to why we do it. And, and this is really tailored for, for those of us that, uh, that reside in the life sciences sector. You know, we do, I think we do what we do in life sciences because we, we actually care about the, the research, the diagnostics, the public health aspects of this. There are a lot of different reasons that, uh, that we do what we do as opposed to something else. And I think that sort of spreads through the entire uh, life sciences business unit here at Merrick. Otherwise, we wouldn't have so many scientists and veterinarians and public health professionals on our team. So we hope that comes through today. We hope at least our, our uh, energy about why we do what we do comes out of the webinar today. Enough about us. Let's get into the operational planning overview 
and models. And I'm going to start with what we really want you to know. We want you to know that operational and, and strategic planning can reduce the cost and time required to achieve facility operational readiness. We hope when you walk away from this that you agree that operational planning is most successful when it is executed concurrent with the what I call the central dogma of life science facility stand-up, design, construction, commissioning. It also gives us the opportunity to integrate technology. In other words, if we're going to go through an operational planning effort, we should be asking ourselves, what's possible? So I'm going to show you a little bit about what those benefits look like graphically. Here's what we think is going to happen, whether it's a, a research laboratory, uh, an academic facility, uh, you know, pilot plant, a new production area. What we tend to think of is that we're going to go through the design, the construction, the commissioning process, and we think that uh, at some point when that's all done, the keys get thrown to the owner, and, uh, you know, that happens on a Friday. We move in over the weekend, and come Monday, we're up and running. We're doing science, diagnostics, production, what have you. Uh, I don't know if anybody's ever experienced that. This is usually what it looks like, a little bit more. So the reality is there's a pretty big gap that, that accounts for the transition into the facility or the ramping up of the programs. So it can actually incur a lot more time to, to get that where it needs to be. We look at operational planning as a mechanism to reduce that. I'll never tell you that operational planning of life science facilities is going to eliminate that gap, but I will tell you that when we go through a strategic operational planning effort, uh, we help all parties get ahead of things. We're going to hear a lot today about integration of these programs. Uh, these are not necessarily two unrelated tracks. In other words, design, construction, commissioning is one track, and operational planning is another. Rather, we favor an integrated approach uh, that we think benefits everybody. That's really what we're going to talk about today. All right. So we're going to go to the next poll question. And here is your question. Have you or your institution experienced operational delays after construction or commissioning? In other words, you got thrown the keys. You thought you were going to be up and running by a certain date, and it turned out uh, that date got pushed to the right. So I'm going to launch the poll. Poll is open. Cast your votes. We get about 56% of you have voted. I'll leave it open another few seconds here. Apologies if you guys are having issues with your buttons, but it looks like we're still getting a, a pretty good reception. I'm going to close the poll and share the results. So 10% of you say, yeah, we were caught off guard. 10% um, of you said, no, everything went just fine. 80% of you, and this is not unpredictable, 80% of you said, you know, we could have done a better job. Um, wasn't the end of the world. Uh, we certainly could have done better. Great. We'll come back to that. All right. Now, what are we talking about with these tracks? Take a look at this diagram that's on your screen. Sort of the upper blue arrow really describes, uh, you know, an overly simplified version of a facility design process. We tend to start with the basis of design, conceptual planning go into the detailed design phase, construction, commissioning, and eventually you get to the operations phase. The program design, you can see that we can start with a little bit of a strategic plan. What do we want operations to look like? What do we want operations to be? We can help establish those requirements, go through program development, and eventually look to implement those programs. And if these things run concurrently, we sort of look at those in four different segments, visioning, requirements, planning, and execution. That's exactly what we have here. So we're going to start with establishing a vision. And this is different than a mission. 
So in operational planning, we tend to think that sharing a common vision is really the first step towards success. I know this is a, a, a gross overstatement when we put here that the mission is usually defined or defined easier. And don't mistake that for a corporate mission. Uh, what I'm talking about is this facility will produce X. We're going to make X or we do research on Y. Um, in other words, we kind of already have a, a, a sense of what the intent of the facility is going to do if it's new or if we're you know, renovating, transitioning in, what have you. So from that perspective, we feel like the intent slash mission of the facility, you know, that gives us something to work around. What we have to get to the point is we have to, we have to get all parties to align against a common vision. We know that's not an easy process. No life science facility goes up under one person's control, vision, et cetera. But we know when we get the right stakeholders assembled to collaboratively build a model, the result is shared vision. So the question really is, how do you start to build that model? We tend to think about operational models as anchor points or foundations for life science facilities or laboratory programs. So some of the big questions we ask are, can you project what the research, diagnostics, equipment needs, science programs, production, insert your favorite verb, uh, in the future? Are there new capabilities? How do the scientists and facility operators envision IT systems functioning to ensure next-gen operations? The fundamental question we're asking is, what does the laboratory program look like in 10 years? Do we know what that looks like? And do all parties agree whether you're in charge of facility maintenance or whether you're in charge of biosafety or whether you're the facility director? Does, does everybody kind of have that vision of what that looks like and why do we care? When we go through building uh, sort of that operational model, you can kind of see that we can segregate a resulting notional table of contents into the following categories. Really defining the mission, the partners, the relationships, who's got a stake in all of these things, the culture of accountability, quality, regulatory compliance, safety and security, risk and threat management. We wanna be able to define critical laboratory management programs and systems and how they interface. And of course, we can't neglect procedures and training management. When we design an operational model, when we put forward an operational model in a collaborative way, what we're really trying to develop is an idealized vision of what this new facility should be. It sort of sets the, the end game, or we know what we're working towards. It also gives the opportunity for accountability. When we all share the same vision of it, there's less argument of it during the details of organizing that. So continuing forward with you know the process I laid out in the beginning here, let's talk about gathering requirements. This is not a new process. We gather requirements on the facility design side. When we think about what goes into a basis of design, we're really thinking about what does this place have to do? What do the scientists need? A lot of the questions tend to be the same. But I think some of the things that we look at is that the requirements packages help uh, inform the development of operational plans. Some of the things to think about is when was the laboratory design completed? When is the facility actually going to be handed over? What were the inputs from the principal investigators or scientists during design and when was the last time they were involved? And of course, what are the needs that are going to inform those program requirements? How have they evolved in the interim? So let's talk about what some of those requirements are in the gathering stage. Let's look at IT. You're gonna hear a lot more about IT from Steve a little bit later, <clears throat> but I think the point that we wanna make is that often uh, when IT design or architecture design is included in a, a very standard AE, you know, consulting process, a lot of times there, there tends to be a gap. And there is how IT gets designed during the traditional design phase. And then there's really, well, what does IT functionally have to do? And even beyond that, what could IT do? So some of the requirements that we look to gather are, you know, of course, centered around the architecture. Is it adequate for the mission and the vision? Do we know the constraints of the facility? Is there a gap between what the users expect to receive and what infrastructure is capable of giving you back? Are we really looking at best practices? 
What about the science programs? You'll hear me use the word science a lot. Please insert production, research, diagnostics, whatever makes sense to you. We're really talking about a broad spectrum of things here. When we talk about operational planning and transition planning, you really do have to think about, uh, particularly in multi-program institutions, what's the first program that's gonna ramp down? What's the first one to ramp up? How much time do you have to have to prepare? And do you need redundancy between old and new for some period of time? Have you really communicated the steady state dates? You know, who have you committed what to in terms of this facility will be fully operational by X? And of course, is there a strategy to prevent anything that might be involved in the regulatory compliance pathway? For those of us that are familiar with the federal select agent program, we know it's not just a given. And if your operations are contingent upon having a select agent registration, that's something to plan for well in advance. Construction and commissioning interface. Uh, we're going to make a strong case today that operational planning uh, should be an integrated process with the design process, the construction, and the commissioning. So what does that look like? You know, what does that communication pathway look like? Um, do you have the principal investigators or the users? Are they involved in any program changes? That's every contractor's worst nightmare, is finding out that there have been changes and we're already poor in concrete. Where does commissioning in and performance verification begin? In other words, a lot of times what the commissioning contractor is going to do will fall short of what maybe a regulatory compliance person needs. So there can often be a gap there. What about significant equipment, staging, phasing, lead time? Does something need to be in place for commissioning of the building itself? Do we even know what an endurance period is? Final piece of this really is the training and procedure programs. What training has to be developed? How are you gonna build your management tools? Timeline for SOPs? And of course, are you gonna link training and SOP management through a central control system, IT? This kind of goes back to asking the question of what's possible. On the lab management systems, so let's assume that we have completed our transition, but we need requirements for lab management itself. What do the institutional officials need in their hands before they can actually build out their programs? Again, have we looked at some benchmarking? Have we looked at program dynamics that might change or add new capabilities? Do we even have room data sheets? What are they? Why do they exist? Should they be updated? Those are all questions we have to ask. And of course, the transitioning in, you're going to hear us use terms like the endurance run and a burn-in period. You know, have those things been defined? Do we know in terms of time and activities what those, what those uh, points are? You're going to hear a lot today from Andrew about an integrated operations schedule and what those interdependencies look like. Of course, there's always the logistics. How are things actually going to move? Who moves what, when, and how? So the bottom line is that requirements, gathering, organizing, prioritizing, curating, and updating is often the most intensive component of the operational planning process. We encourage you know, the folks that we work with, uh, leave no stone unturned. Uh, the fewer surprises you have uh, at the back end of this, the better. So if I wanted to conclude at least this section of the presentation with what is really required to develop the right requirements packages, it's significant involvement of all identified stakeholders, it's honest contributions, you need skilled guides to tease out the details, diligence to maintain adherence to the operational model, remember that's our agreed upon vision. You've got to have persistence to update the requirements during the development of operational plans. This is not an overnight process. And of course, the ability to distinguish between requirements that are specific for stand-up, i.e. the transition process, versus requirements for steady state operation. Those are two different sets of requirements packages. So if you do it right, you'll have all the requirements necessary to achieve the idealized operational model. We realize that that operational model sometimes will be a moving target. We also know that that'll be updated. But as long as everybody is on the same page, 
it gives us the ability to ask all of the same questions that are going to feed these requirements packages that have significant downstream effects in the operational planning process. From the requirements packages, you're going to, you're going to get several things. Operational and transitional plans. Remember I said there are requirements for transition and there are requirements for steady state operation. But these plans are the things that we have to look at. So we've got to build out those plans. A lot of the questions that we have to ask are the same questions that we were asking about the requirements. We want to be able to give uh, all of the operational partners, the people who will actually be responsible for steady state operations, whether that's a biosafety officer, a production floor manager, uh, any of those folks, they need to have the right tools to move and get started as well as to operate. So we got to write the plans. So if you're wondering about what are some examples of existing, uh, excuse me, or examples of transition plans, here's a couple of points. An institution that must maintain operations in the old facility while operations in the new facility burn in. What does that phasing look like? Is that going to require redundant or duplicate staff? How are you going to resource that? Your facility has multiple science programs with shared resources. How do you transition one or more without total disruption of all? You're moving to a new laboratory information management system. Have you thought through the migration uh, process and the logistics necessary? And as we mentioned before, as another example, there's a gap between where commissioning ends and where performance really needs to be with certain equipment. You've got to have a plan to close that gap. So these are examples of potential transition plan needs. What about operational plans? Let's pretend that we're not so much worried about the move as we are the operations. So here's some example plans there. Your new facility's got new capabilities. There are no training or SOPs. So how are you going to update your management systems to accommodate that? Or, you know, these new capabilities bring about new regulatory requirements. That's something that's really got to be thought about, what those requirements are going to be. The new facility and program is going to adopt a central procurement system. This is no more, you know, there are three academic departments in one building and they all have their procurement. We have found that's highly inefficient. Let's just do this at the entity or the institute level. How are you going to reconcile divisional protocols? Or here's one on the production side. A new building is going to have a pilot production space that's going to encourage external engagement, maybe additional academic or industry partners or startups. What's the mechanism for outreach, engagement, and management? The end result is this. Your transition plan is something you hand to a point of contact that is responsible for the big move. It should, the transition plan should address who, what, when, where, and how. Honestly, uh, we like these when they read like detailed SOPs so everybody knows exactly who, what they should be doing. We also like the, uh, the commissioning approach where you've got checklists that include all elements that are going to tie back to a transition schedule. You're going to hear a lot about an integrated schedule here momentarily. What about for your operators once the move is over? Your operational plan is something that you hand to a discipline lead, like a biosafety officer or a facilities manager or an EHS director. So from the operational plan, that should give them the framework that they can hang all of their discrete program elements from, whether these are policies, procedures, guidelines, training. It's got to make their slice of the institute tick. It should address all the milestones and checkpoints to coordinate with the other programs including bio-risk management with DHS or facilities management's got to tie back to IT. So those interdependencies are also very important. And of course, all of the operational plans should be derived out of that operational model. So we're coming up on the section summary before I hand this over. This is sort of what this looks like now. Your operational model really provides that, that framework, that foundation. Uh, that's going to help us ask the right questions that are going to gather all the requirements in a no-stone-unturned un fashion. Those requirements are going to factor into two different sets of plans. Plans we need to transition, 
and the plans we need to operate. All right. Now that we've kind of been through that, I'm going to go to the next poll question. Operational planning alongside the design and construction process is something we do already. You know, we do it, but this seems more structured. Uh, nope, not for us. We usually get the keys at facility handover and we go from there. Or, you know, honestly, nice job on the, on the presentation and the PowerPoint guys, but I'm not convinced this approach is going to gain us anything. So I'm going to open up that poll now. At about 25%, 35% voting. We'll leave it open another few seconds. All right, I'm going to close the poll and share the results. So 13% of you said this is something we do already. Kudos. 63% uh, said we do it, but this seems more structured. 25% of you said, wow, we usually get the keys at facility handover and kind of figure it out. My sympathies. I've been there. Nobody said that they felt this approach wouldn't gain us anything. So that's, that's relieving to hear. All right, I'm going to hide that. I'm going to hand it over to Mr. Andrew Aldrian, who is going to take us through the nuts and bolts of the project management approach, honestly, that are sort of nuanced for operational planning. Great. Thanks, Ryan. And thank you, everyone, for taking time out of your busy schedules to join us today for this webinar. Uh, Ryan spent a good chunk of time talking about the why of operational planning, why it's important, why it's valuable. And I'm going to spend some time talking about the how how uh, to use various methods or tools or approaches to successfully execute your projects, whatever those projects may be. Um, I'm going to be talking about two specific activities that are critical to successfully executing a project. Again, whatever that project may be. A lot of what we're talking about in this webinar uh, is concerning standing up a laboratory or facility of some sort, but these tools and these processes actually apply to any type of project. Perhaps when you're designing a piece of software, assessing a facility, or as I like to say in my, in my briefs, making a sandwich being a project, creating a schedule and managing risks is really critical to any uh, project success. And what we're talking about here today is a, a new way to approach scheduling and managing risks and in more integrated format. So integrated scheduling and integrated risk management are really core activities to what we are saying needs to be done during as part of an operational planning effort. Now, now what I'm not going to do during this webinar is uh, show you how to build a schedule or discuss, or discuss software, scheduling software, or show you some templates to start filling in. We're going to assume that all of you have a lot of uh, experience building project schedules or managing risks, managing risks on projects you've been before. However, if this is an area where you'd like to see additional feedback from, from Merrick or perhaps see some of these tools or software recommendation, recommendations, please feel free to provide that uh, to us as feedback here at the end of the presentation. What we do intend to do uh, is explain uh, the nuances and differences in scheduling a project or managing risks on a project that has an approach that's less linearly phased, which is reflected in that timeline below, where you see a pretty sequential move from design of a facility to construction of a facility to commissioning of a facility and then standing up the science programs. And really what the differences are in scheduling a project and managing risks of a project that have an approach that's much more consecutive, which is that timeline above, where strategic operational planning is happening concurrent, as Ryan said, with construction, design, construction, design, and commissioning activities, as well as potentially three kind of concurrent paths with science and diagnostic programs starting to uh, stand up happening as well. Um, a little bit of, uh, of a project management lesson here for those of you that uh, that are maybe unfamiliar. The top pyramid or triangle that I'm showing there represents the triple constraint or the holy trinity of constraints that happen throughout all projects, cost, scope, and schedule. 
Naturally, as one of those areas expands or decreases in your project, some combination of the other two must also shrink or grow to accommodate that. Now, a lot of times what we're talking about in our projects here, they have pretty, uh, we're talking about laboratory stand-up projects. The scope is usually fairly rigid. This might be due to clear client demands or regulatory requirements of what you must do, or the cost may be fairly fixed, as is commonly the case in construction projects or due to congressional appropriations that have a limit. So really the most fluid variable that you see in integrated operational planning is typically schedule. And the risks that maybe materialize on a project tend to be best addressed by adjusting schedule or sequencing activities that you that you do. Now, uh, for a laboratory stand-up project that has a design component or a construction and or construction component and a science program stand-up component, et cetera, you typically see different team members that might be responsible for building the schedule or capturing the risks with each of those phases. You might even have different contractors who are working on those things that aren't speaking as much to each other or contractually unable to share data or share schedules with others. You might have different offices within your organization who are handling the construction part of your project or the science program standard part of your project. You probably even have different deliverable deadlines that might, that might be submitted to your leadership or to your clients. Now, now the re reality is that an integrated operational planning effort requires a dedicated team who has insight uh, and vision of each of these phases understands the risks that are associated with each and understands how those risks or scheduling nuances affect the other phases as well. You don't want separate design scheduling efforts or separate design risk efforts that are not connected to or are not thinking about how those risks, if they materials might affect science and diagnostic program stand up, even if that comes several years down the road. Um, the reality is that risks that are realized in one project phase, such as design, may have an impact on on project phases further down the line, like I said about science program stand up. And similarly, a risk that was realized in one project phase likely could have or should have been mitigated or exploited or addressed earlier in a project phase. If we can move to the next slide here. Um, I wanna talk a little bit more about risk management here in the context of, of laboratory operational planning. Now, when I say risk, I'm not talking about bio risk and in risk of infection or exposure or release. And I'm not talking about uh, risk in terms of uh, security breaches or anything like that or insider um, or insider threats. I'm talking about classical pro project management risk in a sense that we're talking about things that could affect the cost, schedule, or scope of your project or could cause the cost, schedule, or scope of your project to change. Uh, now, every project risk has several different characteristics or qualities about them that I'd like to spend a little bit of time making sure that we're clear on because it's going to really hammer home this point that I'm going to make next. Um, as part of your project's risk management approach, you typically start to populate a risk register or a risk list with the data points that I'm about to talk about for each line in your risk register. Now, the risk event is the most easy one. That's the if in your if-then statement. If X happens, then Y will result. So if a tornado strikes, then Y will result. Now, we're talking about risk triggers. Triggers are how you know if your risk is about to occur or has occurred. So if our risk event is a tornado striking, then the trigger may be noticing clouds or rain or hail or TV warnings. These can allow you to get out ahead of a risk before it strikes, and then you have to do some damage control mode in a, retro in a reactive manner. A risk outcome is the then in your if-then statement. If the event occurs, then what is the result and what is the impact on your project? A risk probability, uh, this, is a typic, this is a number that's typically on a percent scale with a limit of zero or one on either end of the risk. A risk cannot have a zero or one probability or a zero percent or 100 percent probability because naturally that means it's no longer a risk. It's a reality or a certainty. Risk impact is the predefined threshold for, for categorizing and measuring the effect on your project. You typically give each risk impact a a number of one through five or one through 10 on a scale. And that number corresponds to some amount of measurable impact on your project, whether it's $5,000 of extra cost growth or six months delay in a, in a project and so on and so forth. Um, you, know, you, you create a risk score, which is a product of that impact and that probability. And you develop a risk response strategy, which is how you're going to ensure that the risk does or does not happen. And remember, some risks are positive. Those are opportunities. Some risks are negative. Those are threats. You want to maximize the amount of opportunities that your project encounters or sees, and you want to minimize 
the amount of threats that your project encounters. And each different type of risk has a different risk response strategy. Do you want to just accept the risk? Is it something that you cannot control? Can you mitigate the risk in, in the case of, of threats, or can you enhance risks in the, in case, in the account of opportunities? Now, while all of that may have been fa fairly clear or old news for you, integrated risk management requires you to think about your overall project less lin linearly, as I explained on the previous slide, uh, than you may have done before. Now, many people might be familiar with the, the phrase, you know, it's more chess than checkers when you're doing, going through a process in your project. Well, I would argue that integrated risk management is more 3D chess than chess. Now, if you look at this graphic on the screen, and think of each plane or each board or each level on the 3D chess board as a different phase in your project. Maybe the top one represents design, the second or middle board represents construction or commissioning, and the bottom board represents science program stand-up. Think of each of your opponent's pieces as a risk that's threatening that project phase or that, or that uh, board that you're working on. And each of your chess pieces represents a risk response strategy that you're trying to maneuver to thwart a risk that you're working on. Now, as a risk is approaching your project on, let's say, the middle level, so construction, you have to be thinking about how you're moving a risk or you're implementing a risk response strategy at potentially a different plane or a different project phase to respond to that. So if a construction risk is moving forward or is materializing, you might have a risk response strategy that's implemented during the science program stand-up phase, or perhaps you're mitigating that risk or enhancing that opportunity during the design phase. So really, it's, it's less about uh, thinking about risks in a singular project phase, but really there are things you can do before or after a risk materializes using in different project phases or domains to help thwart those. Um, so really, the last thing I want to say here is integrated risk management is not just separately having your staff fill out a risk register for design phase or construction and commissioning and moving on to science program, but you really have to think about the risk characteristics above, and they might have data that's inserted in them that reside in different project phases or have different technical domains in there. For example, a risk that might have been identified during the design phase, such as choosing the wrong floor material for your animal holding rooms, may have a trigger that is realized or observed during the construction phase, such as the epoxy material isn't passing initial sanitation tests, that may have an outcome during the commissioning stage, which is you're not passing your actual commissioning tests overseen by regulators, and has a sister impact area on the science program schedule and ability to start performing research or diagnostics in your facility. I'd like to talk a little bit about scheduling here as well before we move on. Like risk, Scheduling an integrated operations scheduling or developing or developing an integrated master schedule is a multifaceted uh, uh, activity uh, that requires an integrated approach. So separately creating or maintaining a schedule for construction and then sign stand up or inter any intermediate steps like design or commissioning is not really recognizing and appreciating how interrelated those activities are or how risks might affect all of them. Um, you know what are the qualities of an integrated operational schedule, uh, integrated operational schedule that differentiates itself from some of the traditional schedules you may have made in Project or Excel just for your piece of this puzzle for construction or science program stand-up. For one, an integrated operations schedule incorporates inputs from all stakeholders and all implementers of any phase. So think of those levels on the 3D chessboard or any domain within your project. So think of the technical domains such as animal care and use, uh, risk management, facilities, IT, et cetera. Uh, you have to bring everyone to the table who can talk about how their activities are going to affect things in other technical domains or in other project phases. Um, uh, an integrated operational schedule serves as the single roadmap or the sheet of music that everyone is working off of. There are no more internal IT schedules or construction only schedules. And really, in order to really mitigate or enhance any schedule risks, um, you need an, inter in an integrated operational schedule that can that can promote consistent messaging and awareness among your team, that can be shared with external stakeholders, and it's the one schedule that really rules them all. Um, a key component of inter integrated operational schedules is that the data contained in them is rooted in activity durations and activity logic and not dates that are just thrown against the wall and hopefully uh, and hopefully met. 
When you focus on duration and logic, your schedule actually becomes flexible and adaptable to real conditions on the ground as, as activities become delayed or as risks become realized. Um, an integrated operation schedule, like all schedules, creates a critical path of activities. That critical path is the sequence of activities that determines the overall project duration and the start and the calculated start and end dates of a project. It's the longest path through your project. An integrated operational schedule will reveal, will reveal that your critical path is likely to bounce between different project phases and project domains. You might find your, your, pro, your critical path starts in design moves through construction and then bounces between different project domains within operational planning and construction or science program stand up like IT, bio risk management, facilities and security. Um, and finally, an integrated operational schedule promotes a mission first or in this together approach to project execution. Um, instead of everyone just focusing on their colored strand of the rope there that you see at the bottom, the project is stronger and better planned when woven together and cross communicated between folks. Last slide here is an example of an integrated operation schedule that Merrick has put together for a federal client that's working on standing up a, a research and diagnostic facility. Uh, we started out creating a work breakdown structure or a skeleton list of activities based on the operational stand up model or the operational model, I should say, excuse me, and that vision for the facility that Ryan talked about earlier. Um, we populated uh, thousands of activities across over 15 uh, technical domains, such as animal care and use, safety, health, and environmental management, security, IT, et cetera. And, and even outside of those technical domains, we integrated key construction and commissioning and science program stand-up milestones that folks can anchor their activities to so they know when they can access the lab, when they can perform activities, when they can test OP, SOPs, et cetera. Um, and finally, this integrated oper operational schedule uh, created and displayed peaks and valleys in internal and external staff utilization so folks could see uh, when budget requirements are going to hit, when uh, new at, new hires needed to come on board, et cetera. So with that, I'm going to I'm going to pause here. I think we have a poll question that we're going to put out for everyone there. We do. Um, now that we've been through sort of a, a debrief on integrated operations schedule, <clears throat> it looks complicated. I know. We are curious to know the opinions of this from. You know, is it a really good idea? I like the idea of integrating construction and operational planning. It's a good idea, but it seems like a lot of work to get to the right info. I'm not sure it's worth it. Let's see what you guys say. So I'm going to launch the poll. Poll is open. Got about half of you voted, a little over half. All right, we've got about 75%. I'm going to close the poll and share the results. So, uh, about 60, 64% said this is a good idea. I like the idea of integrating everything. 36% of you, about a third of you, third of who voted, uh, said, yeah, this is a good idea, but it seems like a lot of work. Uh, that's the truth. It's a lot of upfront work. The, the utility that you get out of the back end of this, though, is uh, pretty, pretty powerful when you consider that um, now that you've identified tasks, owners, action items, deadlines, resources, uh, and you spit out, you know, regular reports, whether they're once a week, once a month. Uh, it has become sort of the the ultimate way to keep everybody on track with with everything. So nice reservoir of information there. Great, thank you everyone for uh, for listening to my comments there on integrated operational schedules and integrated risk management. I hope you're walking away with a little bit better understanding of the nuanced differences between kind of traditional scheduling for things that are very linear, uh, for projects that are very linear, and you know some of the differences in doing scheduling and risk management for more integrated and uh, concurrent projects such as standing up a facility. I'm happy to answer any questions that you have or provide any additional information at the end of the presentation. Back to you, Ryan. Great, yep, and remember we do have the questions box in the GoToWebinar function. If you've got a question, please feel free to drop it there. Uh, in the meantime, we're going to hand it over to Mr. Steve Lewis, who, now that we've had the big 
overview of fundamentals of what operational planning is, uh, what the major products are, and what some of the significant project management tools and how they've been adapted specifically for integrating operations. Uh, we're going to diverge a little bit and talk about the IT process. This has become such a critical component of life sciences facilities. We wanted to tackle this one uh, independently. Um, from the perspective of both the challenges and the opportunities it presents. So, Steve, over to you. All right, great, thanks so much. Uh, good afternoon to everyone on the East Coast, at least. I hope you're having an excellent day. Uh, everyone and Mountain and Pacific time, good morning. Uh, so, yeah, now that we've had a little bit of a deep dive into operational planning, you know, I figure it's a good time to right in the middle of the presentation, have a deep dive into everyone's favorite nerd topic, IT. Um, so before we get started though, I wanna take an opportunity to ask a couple of questions here. Um, so the very first question is, how many of you fall asleep when the IT guy starts talking? Um, fortunately, <laughs> Uh, I'm gonna try to keep this as interesting as possible. Um, and uh, for those following along, not sure if the screen has frozen or not um, on the slide deck there, but uh, we will try to get that working here in a second. Um, and the second slide, or excuse me, second question is, uh, does your IT guy have a life science background? Um, we think that that's a critical component of life science facility stand up. Um, and we definitely really want to make sure that it becomes clear that you're not just trying to implement IT, you're, aren't, you're trying to uh, implement IT for a life science facility. Um, so we are really um, passionate about the idea of, you know, there's critical components of a life science facility that um, you absolutely want to have um, stood up by a uh, really strong IT team and we want to make sure that you know the capabilities of the facility actually match what you hope uh, to implement at your site. Um, hold on one second, we're having a technical And apologize for that. So the first thing that we um, would like to talk about is how do you create the facility of the future? Um, not sure if Folks, it looks like we're having some issues coming out of that last poll. Uh, I'm going to try to reset this. Bear with us. Thank you.
All right, great. It looks as if the slides are working now. Appreciate everyone's patience. Uh, ironically, during the IT section, having a little bit of a challenge with GoToWebinar here. Um, but we got the slides up and running. So like I said, my first couple of questions are, you know, does your IT guy have a life science background? We think that that's a critical component because it's not like standing up an office building. It's really like standing up a really specialized facility with a lot of different capabilities that you have to consider with um, the science that's going to be going on in the building. Uh, so moving into the next slide. Uh, the question you got to ask yourself here is how do I create a facility of the future? You know, in a lot of cases, it takes uh, time to actually build um, a facility, especially a life science facility, especially anything higher than a BSL-2. So you want to make sure by the time construction and com uh, commissioning is complete, you don't want to have an obsolete facility. And so the idea is, as part of operational planning, you can actually explore uh, what we call the art of the possible. And that means, you know, looking out, projecting out five, 10 years after the facility is fully operational, uh, you want to explore, okay, what are some of the capabilities that we need from an IT perspective in the facility in order to make it uh, work well into the future? In a lot of cases, laboratories and life science facilities, you know, have a lifespan of higher than 30 years. And so you want to make sure that as you're doing operations in that facility that it means, may, uh, maintains its uh, performance over time. So how do you do that? Um, one way would be uh, planning with experts and then working with them to actually build it, um, taking all of the different operational planning components from the uh, previous uh, slides that we've gone through and actually working together to come up with, okay, you know, we're going to need expanded IT capabilities. It's likely that we're going to need more storage, more imaging, uh, more components of the science, more sequencing information housed in the facility as, as technology costs come down. How do we actually implement that? So over time, our new facility is able to actually um, maintain its uh, full operational capability, uh, not just on day one, but potentially on day 30 to 50 and, or, uh, and beyond. So moving into uh, that some important considerations here, uh, you really got to think up front, you know, it's not just a guy in a room doing IT stuff who kind of stands all this up. When you're talking about a new facility or even a transition, you're talking about what does every single laboratory and program and operational uh, need have throughout the facility? So you want to make sure um, you want to make sure that you have the right users involved up front. Uh, who is important? You know, you may not think that, for example, a lab tech would be a critical person to interview as part of the IT stand-up process. But we've actually seen through our experience that it becomes the critical component to actually interview people um, at all levels of the organization. So not just operational, but all the way down, um, even to the facilities management folks, trying to get an idea of what IT capabilities can we implement in the new facility to make your uh, lives easier. Um, one thing that's kind of interesting is we've noticed with some of the partners that we work with, they're not even thinking about IT until after construction is complete. Um, you know, you might think a little bit of, okay, we need, we know we need wireless in the building. Um, but we've noticed that there's a marked difference in, uh, between the organizations that we work with who do the operational planning up front, get all of the laboratory programs up uh, ahead of time, identifying all of their systems, software, and application needs, and making sure that the facility is actually ready to go on day one. So this actually becomes a critical component of operational planning because if you uh, don't do this uh, planning up front, it can suck a lot of time out of uh, all of your operational stand up from day one. And so if you don't do it ahead of time, you're going to be do it when they do hand over the keys to you. Uh, and that can take a lot of time and honestly uh, result in delays of up to a couple of years if you haven't if you need a lot of system software and applications stood up but don't have the mechanism ahead of time and the operational planning as part of the construction and commissioning process 
finally, you know, one of the one of the interesting case studies that we've had here is how do you know that your Wi-Fi will work as expected? A lot of uh, construction companies will include, okay, we'll put these drops here and here and here in each of the rooms, and we think that the Wi-Fi will work uh, with this particular range. But let's ask a question. Have you considered some of the large equipment uh, that would go in the rooms? Have you considered some of the uh, radio frequencies that might cause interference in the wireless access points? All these things can uh, interact with and cause issues with uh, potential full operational capability of the facility and result in a really bad user experience for your scientists and operational staff. And believe it or not, you know, everybody wants to blame the one guy in this room, right, the IT guy. But honestly, it's an operational planning uh, approach that could be taken up front to mitigate the Wi-Fi issues ahead of time. And so that's, believe it or not, uh, one thing that's overlooked a lot in construction and commissioning projects, the, important of understand, the importance of understanding uh, how do we make sure before anyone even steps foot into the facility that we know for a fact our facility uh, will have uh, internet support the way that we expect. And we'll talk about how we do that here in a couple of slides. So as part of this process, you know, what, what does that actually look like? So operational planning for IT starts out similar to some of the other processes, but we focus on the uh, equipment, systems, software, and applications of the facility, uh, and specifically gathering information from uh, those stakeholders involved in the process of what capabilities they might need. A lot of uh, uh, clients that we've worked with will talk about the need to upgrade new systems, new inventorying, new uh, freezer management, new uh, building operations. All of that is great, uh, but when you're talking to a uh, stakeholder, you want to make sure that uh, you have all the details of what that means, right? You can't just say new. You actually have to understand specifically what needs to be done. And that's where this requirements gathering process comes into play. We, uh, as a team, interview uh, your facility stakeholders, the people who actually run the science and operational programs, uh, and we translate those needs into te technical requirements so that we can actually make sure that we're developing a high-level design for your IT architecture plan to make sure that from day one, as part of the construction process, you're set up uh, with the right layout for the facility to make sure that you have all the necessary equipment uh, to support all of the scientific and operational needs. From there, uh, you would develop a system software and applications list and integration plan. Um, you know, everything from quality management all the way down to service contract management, all the way to specific bioinformatics uh, applications. This is where I start to talk about the criticality of you're not just trying to set up an IT system, you're trying to set up an effective IT system for life science professionals. And that's a critical component is you want to make sure that your IT guys actually know what it means to work in a facility like this so that you can make sure that the uh, considerations and important needs of your scientists are understood from day one. It's not as simple as, hey, go buy this software. It's make sure this software is, uh, is configured for all of the needs that we have organizationally. You know, you may not want, uh, let's say, a certain technician having access to the entire uh, inventory for your biological repository. That role-based access control is a con critical component to understand. And I would say, uh, you know, general IT for, uh, professionals who stand up this kind of infrastructure may not understand the importance and um, even kind of impact that could be had uh, it, it, unless they understand the science and uh, needs of the facility. So from there, uh, you would move into um, support for procurement of all new systems. And so of course, with new systems, there's going to be a need for, okay, if we buy it, how do we stand it up? How do we actually make sure it's configured to our needs? Especially when you start talking about um, some of the, uh, I, 
some of the Aya Cook um, in the case of animal uh, facilities, systems that might need to be done from a regulatory compliance perspective, um, tracking and monitoring and approval. Um, all, all of that is a critical aspect, especially for new systems that go in. And then, of course, there's also integration that needs to occur, right? There's existing systems that you may have from your parent organization um, or uh, outside laboratories that you may need to integrate. Um, so all of those services in terms of how do we get all of our equipment into the facility and then once all the equipment's into the facility, how do we install the software and applications uh, on, the, uh, on, the soft, on the hardware and then make sure that it's all integrated and working and then testing. All of that's a critical aspect of operational planning, believe it or not. And this all happens during the construction and commissioning process as part of it. And so that's one thing to keep into consideration is you're not just planning for, okay, once it's up and running, how do I install my software? If you're waiting until you have the keys to the facility to figure all of that out, uh, unfortunately, you've waited too long. And like I said, you could uh, result in up to probably a two year delay getting all of your systems online. Um, and just for general awareness, you know, you're know, you talking about 40, uh, to 60 systems on the high end just to operate for general operations of a biosafety level three facility. And so that's a lot to plan for. Um, and you do need that lead time and it's best to do it during the construction and commissioning uh, phases because then you get the opportunity to take care of it uh, and you don't have scientists just standing around in the facility not having the IT support what they need to do uh, with their science. And then finally, making sure, right, confirming that the end users, the scientists in the facility, the laboratorians, the operational staff, the facility staff, EH&S staff, HR, making sure that everything uh, from a functional perspective, all of the IT capabilities and support that are needed actually work for the end user. And like I said, that's something that you want to do. Uh, as part of the process in, in an offline network before it goes live, prior to making sure uh, that the scientists are all in the facility. It's one thing to get everybody in there. It's another thing to make them actually have their full ability to do their jobs. And that's where we definitely believe that operational planning for IT can really help get them doing their jobs in an, in an expedited way. And then after that, you know, there's different there's different components. It's not just a matter of making sure that ahead of time everything is in there, but also making sure that the operations and maintenance phases are taken care of too. Uh, so supporting the training for the staff uh, is, a, is a critical aspect. And then as well too, being there to support any additional needs that might occur, um, potentially hiring of uh, IT staff, making sure that those staff actually can support uh, when there are issues in the facility, because um, at a certain point, the facility just has to start running. And we, uh, in our case, we believe that operational planning is the perfect opportunity for making sure that all of the uh, training uh, needs are taken care of. Even as you're moved into the facility, you have an opportunity through what's called the burn-in period uh, to kind of make sure everything is running smoothly up once everything is installed. So yeah, all of this is leading to specifically operational readiness. You know, how does the enterprise architecture, how does the business goals align with the strategic approach? How can the technology support both the business and the strategy? And this is one thing where you really got to consider how many things are going on in a, in a facility uh, specifically to make it uh, fully ready to operate. Um, so there's just a couple of lists on the screen in terms of all the different uh, IT capabilities that need to occur. Um, and so this is a past performance example of all the different things that we have uh, managed here at Merrick in terms of with some of our uh, prior clients, uh, everything from access control all the way to uh, sequencer stand up, all the way to SOP development and calibration, uh, laboratory information management systems, electronic laboratory notebooks, regulatory compliance software, all of these considerations, you know, it's a lot to take on before you even move 
into the facility. And that's where we believe operational planning for IT makes a huge difference in helping you to transition in faster. Uh, and finally, uh, I, I had mentioned previously about the idea of, um, you know, how do you know for a fact that your Wi-Fi will work? Uh, we had a client in the past who, um, and, and this is just so you know, a, a dummy building layout. This isn't actually a uh, graphic of a anything that we've worked on. Um, but I just wanted to make everyone aware that there, there's an opportunity to guarantee that your Wi-Fi works the way it should up front. Um, and you can kind of see the wireless site study and survey is a component of that. Um, so I won't run through all of the different uh, er areas here um, in terms of uh, the, the details, because I don't want to bore anyone, but the important thing to note is there are ways working with the construction team way ahead of time before anybody even gets into the facility, before construction is even done, to make sure that your uh, cabling, even your communications and data cables are placed in the right location for what your needs are. And so this is just a representative graphic of, uh, we have software that we perform during active site survey um, where there may be interference due to thickness of walls. And that's the case with the red areas that you see on the screen. Um, whereas with the green areas, that would be uh, really uh, solid wireless support that you, that you could get. And so the idea is you don't want to, after construction is done, realize that there are dead spots, those dark red areas. You wanna take care of that during the construction process. And there are absolutely ways to do that. And we think that that's one uh, really important factor because everybody wants the internet just to work. And you know, in a lot of cases, after the facility is done, if you find out it's not working, there's a lot of time and money that's spent into retrofitting a finished facility to make it work a little bit better. Um, so in the case of uh, making sure that you've got operational readiness, this wireless site survey uh, and study is something that we absolutely recommend as part of the uh, construction uh, process. All right, thank you, Steve. We're moving to a poll question here to close out the IT section. The way I feel about IT op in operational planning is relying on the design process, design construction process is not enough. We do need to do more. Uh, you know, the processes we've used to design our facility, including uh, the IT systems, has served us pretty well. Uh, or I wish we had, uh, I wish we'd plan better. I know this from past experience. So I am going to open the poll now. Poll is open. <gasps> All right, a few more seconds. All right, let me close the poll. Rather than share them in the event we lose screen again, I'm gonna tell them to you. 75% of the respondents said relying on the design process is not enough. 25% of you said, I wish we had planned better. Nobody said that their process to date has served them well. So there you have the results. All right, I assume we still have visual on the screen. I am going to move forward with the final section of the webinar today, which is really about planning, staging, and transition management. We've talked a lot about the operational piece. Questions for consideration, the basics. What needs to move? How much is there? When do you need it? And have you thought about the lead times? How do you get there? Uh, we all know that moving is a pain. So if you're moving from one facility, such as an old facility, to a new facility, uh, or whether it's totally new, uh, you're building something entirely new and, and you just have to start it up, not drawing from something previous or old, it's still a pain. 
So I think this is a good a good stage to kind of review where we've come from and where we are. So we started with that operational model. And from that, we were able to generate two sets of requirements. What we think of as the requirements for steady state operation, as well as the requirements for transition. What we've talked about a lot are the operational plans. And, uh, and of course, now we're talking about the transition plans. But sort of the interface between those is that integrated operations schedule, which Andrew talked about. So this is really how sort of that whole spectrum comes together, knowing that, uh, you know, we are on two separate but related tracks. All the transition plans should support eventual implementation of the operations. All right. So we know that integrated planning Moving is not about the move itself. It's about the end state. Adherence to that operational model. As we just showed in the last graphic, it's informed by the requirements process and the integrated operations schedule. So here are the considerations for the actual logistical moving uh, standing up process. Who are the stakeholders and who are the decision makers? Are they different? Are you going to need additional staff during the transition phase? Remember, we mentioned uh, the possibility of having redundant functionalities. If you're moving from one facility to the new and you've got operations you can't shut down. Have you defined facility burn-in activities and durations? So you're just now getting into the building. You're just now turning on lights, turning on bench top equipment or production equipment, uh, just starting to get things moving. Do you know what's involved in that? Is that a designed process? Have you identified what's really needed for initial versus steady state operations? In other words, <clears throat> this is this is your earlier milestone to say, yep, we've got uh, we've got initial capability <clears throat> versus what you want to have for true steady state operations. Do you have a process to document everything? Change management is critical. Can't really stress that one enough. If you don't have a good change management process, as you know, dozens or more stakeholders, decision makers, operators, as the requests, requirements, changes, et cetera, are coming up from all directions, how is that process managed? The other thing that's important is to enforce the timeline. If you say that you're going to do something by this point or some, you're holding somebody accountable to execute part of a transition, enforce that, not only to protect you know, slippage to the right, but you also don't want to set a precedent that it's okay to continue to push things to the right. So what are the lessons learned out of the transition management piece? Obviously get the right people in the room. Ask if you're missing anybody. It's perfectly fine. Get only those people in the room. You're not looking to bring on extra baggage. Everybody's got an opinion. It may not be the right opinion that's going to advance the, the product. Clear and consistent communications, that's fine. If you don't know an answer to a timeline, don't give one. You don't have to be bullied. It's okay to rely on people that do have the information. Andrew talked a lot about the linkages to other parts of the project. Document what they are and communicate those. Understand that you may not be able to move in until finishes have put, been put down on the floor. You don't want to guess those dates. You want to know those dates. You want to be able to integrate that construction or commissioning milestone with the operational milestone. Obviously, patience is going to be a big one. Change is hard for everybody, especially hard if you're a scientist. Um, I'm not exactly sure what that means. I don't know if I should be offended as a scientist by this comment or not, but uh, I get it. Transition requires support from people who have no incentive to provide it, right? A lot of times you're going to be relying on people to do things that are not in their day-to-day -day job description. Find a way to incentivize, you know, without looking to create fault or damage. Compassion is always a good thing. This is gonna, this is gonna ripple, ruffle some feathers rather. All right, so here's our final poll question of the day. And transition planning is, not full operational planning, I'm just talking about the transition piece. Something we do really well, we could do this better, We've been totally unprepared in the past. I'm going to open that poll. Poll is open. Got 
Got about half of you voted. Give it a few more seconds. All right, I'm going to close the poll and read you guys the results. About 30% of you said this is something we do really well. About 70% of you said we could we could do this better. Nobody said they were totally unprepared. That's good, right? It would be terrible to come to work Monday morning and find out that was move day and you had no idea. So, uh, but yeah, it could always be done better, no doubt. Uh, so we we have found that you know working from that operational model forward into building discrete, specific transition plans uh, is about the best way to move forward. The last piece of this is really about execution. So establishing those laboratory operations. This is something that I think we would do a uh, a separate uh, webinar for in the future. I'm not going to go into a whole lot of detail other than to say that establishing these laboratory operations is really successful, successfully executing what we've talked about to date. Um, we know that the mission doesn't end there. We know that we can build a scaffolding through an operational plan for an environmental health and safety program, but it's going to be up to the long-term uh, EHS personnel and owners to really build out their programs and make those into operational uh, programs. So what we've talked about from an execution standpoint up to this point is that we've prepared the institution for full comprehension of all moving parts uh, in a phased manner at times. We hope that we've convinced you that the integrated operations schedule is gonna give you that scaffold for milestones, metrics, and progress uh, that also provides discrete tasks and owners, but is done in an integrated way where we've got shared milestones between design, construction, commissioning, and operations, and transition. From an execution perspective, it's also good to uh, train and communicate against those transition plans and those operational plans. Of course, that means identifying who's doing the training and who needs to get trained. But the important thing, use the tools. That integrated operation schedule should really be used to generate the progress reports and hold those points of contact accountable. When it comes down to how this all fits together, that operational model provides a vision and a scaffold. The requirements packages really define expectations of all users. Those requirements packages now can be used to build a truly integrated operational schedule, which results in operational and transition plans. All these things define the interdependencies, actions, owners, et cetera. So to my point, just uh, two slides back, execution is really driven by all of the above, uh, hoping that we're gonna achieve steady state in a very practical and accountable way. So to sort of wrap up where we are today, what are the, what are the key advantages of operational planning that we have found uh, in terms of reducing operational risks, and that can be schedule delays, that can be cost increases, whatever. We know that the visioning process and developing those operational models really helps build transparency and accountability across the enterprise. Uh, having concurrence uh, you know, at the onset of an endeavor like this, I uh, can't say enough about the, the impact that has. <clears throat> Everybody always wants to know what the transition process is. What are we moving? What's moving first? How is it going to move? Are we just walking stuff up the sidewalk? Are we shipping it across the country? Uh, those logistics questions, just managing the information flow and the Q&A can be exhausting in significant uh, projects. We also know that this reduces the time and cost to stand up into steady state. Um, the application of a lot of the project management tools and the way that we use them in an integrated fashion, the way that Andrew explained, uh, really helps provide real-time info and progressing and tracking. And this is really a good structured process that helps us ask what's possible. Think about if you're gonna take the time to build an idealized operational model and gather those requirements, <clears throat> you shouldn't be looking to the institution you're in now. You should be looking to the institution that you wanna be in. And of course, we know that there's a difference between wants and needs, and we know that there's a difference between can-haves and not budget for. That being said, you should be thinking about what is possible with whatever the constraints that I'm presented with. This is a great opportunity for that technology integration, particularly 
particularly on the IT architecture side of things. The bottom line is that we know that this process helps ensure that the mission is integrated effectively. Whether your mission is research or diagnostics, uh, vaccine development, uh, clinical operations, it can be whatever that life sciences facility is intended to do, uh, but we want to reduce the time, the cost, and the risks that go into getting there effectively. So at this point, I want to say thank you to the, the folks uh, that have contributed to a lot of the operational planning. Uh, what you see on the screen here is sort of our laboratory operations core team here at Merrick. Um, special shout out to Dr. Lauren Richardson, who was unable to be a panelist on the today's webinar, but contributed an awful lot of the material that you saw. Um, and then finally, for questions, comments, or suggestions, you know, we'd love to hear what you guys think. If we haven't heard it through the comments or questions on the webinar, if you've got suggestions for other webinar topics in the future that you would like to hear from, or if you want some more follow-up on what you've heard today, a little bit more detail. You can always reach out to Kelsey. Yeah, please feel free to email me um, if you do have any, honestly, questions, concerns, comments, anything of that nature. Um, and I'll be sure to pass it along to our presenters and uh, Lauren, our content creator, as well. All right. Thank you, everybody, for joining. Thank you to the panelists. And we'll be back uh, in a little while with uh, another edition from the Life Sciences webinar series. Thank you all for attending.